Um, well, this book is The Believing Brain, and it's my tenth book, and the first book was Why People Believe Weird Things. So this book is about why people believe things. But the publisher didn't like the, that title, so. <laughs> um, uh, but it is, it's about, you know, full stop, everything, not, not just the weird stuff. And so I begin with the idea that, in my usual array of things that we discuss in Skeptic Magazine, uh, UFOs and the paranormal and ESP and PSI and the CIA and the FBI and the KGB and the conspiracists and, you know, the whole array of things. Uh, but in fact, that's just a subset of larger beliefs uh, in which we form connections from things. So I start off the book talking about patternicity, the tendency to find meaningful patterns of both meaningful and meaningless noise. So it's not just that we are good at seeing the face of Jesus in a tortilla or the Virgin Mary on the side of a building. That, that we are good at, but in fact, the reason we're good at that is because we're good at finding patterns of global warming or patterns of subatomic particles or, or patterns of expanding cosmos. That it, it's the same process that what we do in science is also what we do in pseudoscience. So the problem is larger than I thought it was. <laughs> because it, had, it has to do with how the brain works. So um, we begin with just pattern seeking, we're just pattern seeking primates. We just connect A to B and B to C. And, and often A really is connected to B and B really is connected to C. And when you learn that, that's called learning. <laughs> that's why they call it that. Uh, so whether it's the, you know, you ring the bell and and you give the dog some food, and he salivates, and you ring the bell, you give him some food, and he salivates, you ring the bell, he salivates. Okay, so that's classical conditioning, Pavlovian conditioning. Everybody learns that. That's association learning. That's that's pattern, That's kind of a, a pattern connection. Or you get the rat, you put the rat in the box, and he, every time he moves close to the, the bar, you give him a little pellet, and he runs over and gets it, and he realizes, hey, if I get close to the bar, I'm going to get that pellet. But you make him go closer and closer every time until he actually touches it, and he closes the electrical switch himself, and then he's conditioned. He's operating conditioned. And that's, that's called operating conditioning. So that's also association learning. All the same process. We know what happens in the brain. The brain develops new interneural connections. These, these neurons in your brain are not actually connected physically. They have a little tiny gap called the synapse, in which there's these little chemical transmitters that zap across that gap. Uh, in which that turns on the next neuron to fire, and that's how it all works. So I have a whole chapter on that. So I just summarized 15 weeks of neuroscience. <laughs> uh, but most of you are pretty familiar with that, that, that whole process. But what's interesting is the kinds of chemicals that are doing that. Dopamine, for example, turns out to be one of these neurotransmitter substances that leaps across that little synaptic gap. And when you give subjects more dopamine, they tend to see more patterns. So these are this is research by some psychologists in uh, England, Peter Breuer and Christine Moore, who gave subjects L-DOPA. And L-DOPA increases the amount of dopamine in your brain. It's used for Parkinson's patients. So if you give them L-DOPA, it causes both skeptics and believers to see more patterns that aren't real. Um, and this isn't necessarily a, a value judgment on people's brains. It's just an observation, because the rub is finding the right balance between recognizing patterns that are true and, and recognizing those that are not true, and that's, that's hard to do. Okay, so here's the thought experiment. You're a, a hominid on the plains of Africa three and a half million years ago. And your name is Lucy. So you hear a rustle in the grass. Is it a dangerous predator, or is it just the wind? Well, so if you think that the rustle in the grass is a dangerous predator, it turns out it's just the wind, you've made a type one error, a false positive. You thought there was a real pattern, it's not a real pattern. But no harm, it's a low cost cognitive error. You're just more vigilant, cautious, you move around, you're skittish. And we all see in the fur, fin, and feather show where the animals are, on the plains are very skittish. But on the other hand, if you think the rustle on the grass is a just the wind, it turns out it's a dangerous predator, <clears throat> you're lunch. Uh, you, congratulations, you've just been given a Darwin Award for taking yourself out of the team. <laughs> so that's a type two error, a false negative, that is thinking the pattern is not real when it is. And that's a much more dangerous Cost. This is a, just a basic cost-benefit analysis of the kinds of errors we can make, and some are worse than others. So I'm arguing that there's no time in the split-second world of the African savanna of predator-prey relationships to sit there and gather more data. Let's run some more experiments on that, Russell and Rex. I think I'll collect some more data and see how it goes. No, no time for that. You just have to make a split-second decision, and so that's what we do. So it's a costlier error to make, a type 2 than a type 1, so we therefore just tend to default and just assume all rustles in the grass are dangerous predators not 
So this is the basis of superstition and all magical thinking. It just comes naturally, it's intuitive, it's instinctive, that's how we make our decisions. Tons of research on this in behavioral economics, for example, behavior finance. Uh, all, the, all the economists have figured out because they finally discovered psychology. <laughs> that if you study what people actually do instead of what they should do mathematically with predictive formulas, it's a very different thing. They'll sit there in front of the toothpaste row and try to figure out which is the right one. Nobody does that. They, they don't sit there and calculate all the ingredients of a toothpaste. They just like the blue one. Boom. Uh, so, and that's how we make most of our decisions under great uncertainty. There's, you know, the, as the, the con economy, the diversity economy described the world as this buzzing, blurring, just flow of data, just you know, hammering our brains, and you just can't sit there and sort through. So you just pick out a couple things and you go. With it. That's how we make almost all of our decisions in life, from jobs to marriage to college, everything. That's what, pretty much what we do. And then, after we've made the decision, then we carefully collect the data to support and reinforce it. <laughs> <laughs> So the beliefs come first, the evidentiary support for it comes second. And our brains are really good at this. Confirmation bias is important. Find confirming evidence for what you already believe, you ignore the disconfirming evidence. You remember the hits, you forget the misses. Uh, everybody does it. Uh, scientists do it. Scientists have their favorite pet theories and hypotheses that they would love to be true. It's how you advance your career. The only difference between that and politics, economics, social attitudes, religious faith, and so on, is that science has a built-in self-correcting machinery that says if you don't look for your disconfirming evidence, somebody else will, and publish it greatly in a public forum, and advance their career by debunking your silly ideas. <laughs> so that's the competitive nature of science, and, and, and it's, thank God it's work that we have that, because, sorry. <laughs> There are times when it just slips out. <laughs> Probably not what I mean. Anyway, so. <laughs> so, 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 um, so I, even though I uh, describe this, uh, this uh, belief dependent realism, this sort of philosophy of science that we can't really know reality except through our beliefs, but I, I'm not a deconstructionist. There is a real world. And we're getting better at understanding it. And it's only because of science. 